And I thought, what a land where military people can say to the whole world, we love God, we love the churches, and we thank God for the fact that today has been a day when we've been privileged to pay in a very special way our own church tribute to the armed forces of the United States of America. And I want to say today that in response to our invitation, you have been the most gratifying group we have ever tried to do anything with. We appreciate it. And I want Jeff Tokar to stand, who has been my arms and my feet and my heart and put all of this together. Let's give him a real hand. <laughs> Just been amazing what he's done, and we thank the Lord for it. Today is the last day of a tremendous revival meeting. God has marvelously blessed. The man you're going to hear preach is one of the great preachers of all time. Dr. Lockridge is a man that God has used in a tremendous and marvelous way. He has blessed our hearts again this year, as he did two years ago, and uh, we anticipate to have him back again because of the blessing he's been to our lives. Dr. Lockridge is pastor of the Calvary Baptist Church in San Diego, California, been his pastor for 37 years. That's a long time. And we're so glad today that we can introduce him to hundreds of you that have never heard him. Today, you'll hear him expound the Word of God as no other person I know can do it. Dr. Lockridge, welcome to our pulpit again. God bless you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kevin. And what a moving moment this is. And where in the world can a meeting like this take place other than in America? And where in America could a meeting like this take place but at the High Street Church under the leadership of God's servant, Dr. David A. Cavett? I said to him this morning, I will always be grateful for the invitation to be with him and the High Street Church here today because this is something I've never witnessed in all of my life. And what a blessing it is for all of us where the church under the leadership of Pastor Dr. Kevin will pay tribute and honor to the military forces of our country. And this stirs and inspires all of our hearts, I'm sure, to love God more and appreciate uh, what the men and women are doing for our country in the military forces. Now, after going through this ceremony and with all that it brings to our hearts, this is a difficult spot to be in to preach. This is just like calling a business meeting after the rapture. I want to use for a subject today one nation under God and for a text 
we turn to the Old Testament, the Psalm 33. And I'll begin reading with verse 8. That's Psalm 33 and verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. And then from the New Testament, we turn to our Lord's Gospel according to Matthew. 14th chapter verse 22 and 23 Matthew 14 22 and 23 and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Let us pray. Our Father, in thy presence, silence becomes us best. But your love has so inflamed our hearts until we cannot but speak. If we would withhold our peace, the rocks will cry out. Yet if we speak, we don't know what to say. So Lord, teach us to pray, teach us to witness, teach us to work, and teach us to wait. Amen. Charles Dickens, in his tale of two cities, described his era in precise and poetic language. He said, we live in the best of times and the worst of times. Our day is no different from Charles Dickens' day. For we live in the best of times and the worst of times. One of the dominant themes in our day is how to change the appalling ambiguities and paradoxes that we face. On one hand, we have abundant wealth. On the other hand, we have abject poverty. We are better educated today than we have ever been. And yet, the employment lines are full. And then we live in better houses 
than we ever lived in in our lives. But our homes are falling apart. We all dressed up. We are vogue on the outside and vague on the inside. There was a time when I could eat anything that I got my hands on, but I couldn't get my hands on much. Now I'm able to buy anything I want to eat, and the doctors tell me, no, you can't have that. <laughs> we live in the best of times and the worst of times. We live in a day when every thinking person ought to give glory to God. We thank him for this meeting here today. This is a great day to be alive and a great day to serve the Lord. Yet, as we meet here, we are aware that we are meeting against the backdrop of mounting world tension. This hate-filled world is desperate for a decent way of life. Now, I'm too ignorant to speak wisely, and I trust I'm too wise to speak ignorantly. But a person does not have to be listed in the who's who to know what's what today. As he stands with a newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other, with his eyes focused on the television, and his ears tuned to the radio, he can hear a walls and rumors of walls rumbling around the world. He can see astounding world events tumbling over each other in rapid succession, rushing on the road. Civilization is torn with degradation and flirting with doom and disaster. High-mindedness runs the streets like a mad dog, beating an uncertain path. Selfishness has evaporated the milk of human kindness, and pain and panic are chasing each other like June bugs playing in the summer sun. Paradise has been turned into pandemonium, and puny men are still piddling around with passing days. Under the magic of science, distance has disappeared. We no longer measure distance by the miles, but by the hours. Los Angeles is 10 hours from London. Now that simply says that isolationism is dead and buried without the slightest hope of a resurrection. Whether you realize it or not, we are interdependent and we are interrelated. We cannot live without each other and we have not learned to live with each other. And unless we learn to live with each other, it is doubtful that we shall live at all. We are one nation under God. And blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord even when we rejoice in that fact. We are worried about our economy. And the Lord has a word to say about the economy even in this day. In this text, Jesus had just fed a multitude. Yes, he had finished speaking, and the disciples went to him and said, Send these people away. Let them go into the village and buy food. Jesus said to them, No, don't send them away. You feed them. And then they began to uh, check their economy. The statistician, the mathematician, figured up how much bread it would take to feed that multitude. And they came back complaining to Jesus about the economy. We're just not able 
to provide food for all of these people, yet you tell us to feed them. And Jesus said, bring me what you have. And you remember they brought him a lad who had five loaves and two fishes. And may I hasten to tell you Jesus is the only one who can multiply five times two and get 5,000. For when he got through multiplying the fish and the bread, he fed 5,000 men beside women and children. He had to teach them that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then when you feed people, they will want to make a king out of you. That multitude wanted to make a king out of Jesus. Even the disciples were taken in with that idea. And the Lord had to teach them something about politics. He had to teach them that you don't make me king. I'm already king. In fact, he always has been king, and he always will be king. You know, all other kings were born a prince, and he had to wait until the father died, or the mother, if she were the ruling monarch, wait until she died, and he had to become king. But my king was born king. In fact, the Bible says he's a seven-way king. He's the king of the Jews, now that's a racial king. He's the king of Israel, that's a national king. He's the king of righteousness, he's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven, he's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. Now, they saw no necessity of prayer. Jesus told him to get into the ship and go before me to the other side. And when Jesus had dismissed the crowd, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And he was there alone. It's obvious if Jesus had to pray what about you and me? While he was up in the mountain praying, the disciples were out there in the ship, a ship that they owned. Not many men in that day owned the ship. Jesus didn't even own a boat. But these were affluent men. And Jesus told him to get into the ship and go to the other side. Not only did they own that ship, but they knew how to handle it. They were good sailors. They were used to sailing the seas. But today, they were there out there on the sea, and all of a sudden, a storm struck. Isn't that just like some experiences we go through in life? When things are going well, all of a sudden trouble rises. There these men, I'm talking about affluent men, well-trained men, they were there in the ship, and when that storm struck, the winds began to blow, the waves got contrary. There they were caught in a situation that they couldn't handle. Now they had been accustomed to sailing the seas before. They had been in storms before, but nothing like this. They struggled with all of their strength to try to bring stabilization to that ship. But the Lord 
allowed them to work and work. And let me tell you, whenever Jesus Christ is out of the picture of your life, you can work your head off and still get nowhere. These men, these men rode and they tried all with all of their might, but to no avail. And they reach the point of panic. And let me tell you, when you reach the point of panic, that's one part guilt and two parts doubt. The, right at that time, Jesus had to let them know that without me, you can do nothing. No matter if you are affluent, no matter if you are experienced at sailing the sea, Without me, you can do nothing. Just at that time when they were about to reach the point of panic, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. And isn't that just like Jesus? Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear. Ready to help me, ready to cheer, just when I need him most. Jesus came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him, they got afraid. And they cried out for fear. It's a ghost. It's a spirit. And it seems to me that if you've ever seen the Lord, you would never forget him. But these the disciples had forgotten about him. There they saw him walking on the sea, and they didn't even know who he was, calling him a spirit. And then Jesus uttered his voice and said, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Isn't that comforting? Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Then the spokesman for the crowd, Simon Peter, I'm talking about that reckless one, that big mouth one, the one who is always showing off, and the one, the one who always leaps before he looks. But that's still better wisdom than a man looking so long he never leaps. And Simon Peter exclaimed, Lord, if it be thou, now, he's all mixed up. He's all confused. The Lord, he had just seen the Lord. He had heard him speak. He had heard him identify himself. It is I. Be not afraid. And yet, he comes back saying, Lord, if it be thou, the Lord had told him it is I, but if it be thou, bid me come to thee on the water. Peter had forgotten his prayers. The Lord taught us to pray in the plural. Whatever you pray for yourself, pray for your neighbor. Give us this day our daily prayer, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But no, Peter is praying a prayer that is filled with pride. His pride made him say to himself, if Jesus can walk around on the water in the dark, I can do it. I want to do it. That's the reason he blurted it out and said, Lord, bid me come to thee. Forget about these other fellows. Just let me do it. He wanted to outdo and out dare the other disciples. And that old spirit is among us today. We want to outdo and out dare everybody else. But one thing I have to give Peter credit for. He didn't get out of that ship to walk the water until Jesus told him. There are a lot of us out here trying to walk the water and the Lord hasn't told us. 
When Jesus said, come, I can see Peter getting out of that boat, getting out of that ship, stepped on the water, and the Bible says that he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now give him credit again. He might not have walked far, but he walked further than anybody else. He walked on the water to go to Jesus and was out there doing fine. But the Bible says, but when he saw the winds boisterous, he became afraid and beginning to sink. Let me tell you, when you take your eyes off of Jesus, you're going to sink. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how well trained you are. When you take your eyes off of Jesus, you're going to sink. Peter found himself sinking, and I give him credit again. He knew whom to call. He didn't call headquarters. He didn't call for some of the other disciples, Philip, Bartholomew. But he said, Lord, and give him credit again. Now he knows how to pray. He didn't stand there, and strike up a pose. Oh, thou who art omnipotent, thy wisdom excites our imagination, and your omnipotence turns every spot on earth to holy ground. He didn't go through all of that. He just said, Lord, save me. And isn't that just like Jesus? When we have ruined our lives, when we've messed up our lives, when we've gone contrary to his will, when we have forgotten about his power, his promises, and go to concentrating on our problems, even then, if you call him, he will answer. The Bible says immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand, brought Simon Peter up and put him back in the boat. Now you notice the storm is still raging. A lot of times the Lord has to calm us before he calms the storm. He calmed Peter. He said, O thou of little faith, why did you doubt me? You have seen me dispel demons. Why did you doubt me? You've seen me break the bonds of those who are bound. Why did you doubt me? You've seen me steal a storm before. Why did you doubt me? You've seen me furnish food for the famishing. Why did you doubt me? You've seen me lavish my love on the least, the lone and the lost. Why did you doubt me? You've seen me confer comfort on the bereaved. Why did you doubt me? You've seen me reconcile ruptured relationships. Why did you doubt me? Didn't you believe me when I said, I am your God? Be not dismayed. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with the right hand of my majesty. Didn't you believe me? Why did you doubt me? I'm saying to America today, in the midst of all of our conflict and crisis, don't doubt the Lord. In this upturn economy don't you doubt the Lord even if Zenith closes down don't you doubt the Lord doesn't matter doesn't matter about how crooked politics gets don't you doubt the Lord then it doesn't matter about the storms of life don't doubt the Lord doesn't matter what unfortunate 
set of circumstances might surround you. Don't you doubt the Lord. You can trust him. For he's the one who walked on the brow of nothing. And with a gesture of his hands, words were formed. He scooped out the seas with the palm of his hand. He dug deep the gorges and piled up the hills and propped up the mountains by his wheel. The moon and stars lean on his arm. You can trust him. The heavens declare the glory of God. The fundament showeth his handiwork. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring in the visibility of the coastline of his soulless supplies. You can trust him. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's a centerpiece of civilization. What I like about him he doesn't need your help and he doesn't need mine. He stands alone in the solitude of himself. He's august and he's unique. He's unparalleled and unprecedented. He is supreme and preeminent. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem of higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's a cardinal necessity of spiritual religion. He's a miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call it. You can trust him. He is able, and the only one able, to satisfy every need according to his own riches and glory. He can take care of all of our needs and he does it simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate, he regards the age, and he rewards the diligent, and he beautifies the meek. I'm trying to tell you, you can trust him. Do you know him? He is the key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? He's a master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's a prince of princes. He's the king of kings. And he's the lord of lords. You can trust him. There's no energy shortage with him. Amen. Things don't run out on him. The resources, the reservoir of resources never recedes. The wisdom of his word never wanes. The vigor of his virtue never varies. The burnish of his beauty never blemishes. The lust of his love never lessens. The prowess of his power never perishes, and the fountain of his fullness never fails. Well, I wish you knew him like I do. Well, his office is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. 
His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you, but he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible and he's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. You can trust him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand it. But they found out they couldn't stop it. Pilate couldn't find any fault in it. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And thank God, the grave couldn't hold him. Amen. You can trust him. He always has been and always will be. I'm talking about he had no predecessor and he'll have no successor. There was nobody before him, that's what I'm saying, and nobody after him. You can't impeach him and he's not going to resign. You can trust him. Would you bow your heads, please? Our Father, how glad we are today to know that thou art the everlasting God. 